Our next reader will be introduced by Christopher Beaumont. Evening. No, this introduction was originally set to Bach. Uh, uh, okay, um, I'm, I'm honored that uh, Mark asked me to introduce him tonight. Uh, being in my fourth class with him, I, I joke that I'm getting my master's in Mark Farrington. Uh, Mark is he's a true a true teacher and as someone that has studied in multiple graduate programs I can say without a doubt uh, that he's the best professor I've ever had uh, some people say writing can't be taught they never had a class with Mark I guarantee your writing will be better after a class with him everyone I know in the program agrees Mark is a walking book on craft. His knowledge has earned him monikers like Yoda, Mr. Miyagi, and the truth. I don't, I don't think he knows about these. <laughs> uh, a professor in the program once told me, if Mark said it, believe it. <laughs> the attention and expertise Mark lends to his students' work is unparalleled. It is the perfect balance of criticism and encouragement. Thanks to Mark, I have gone from being a student in a writing program to a writer in a writing program. For this, I am humbled and forever grateful. Mark has published numerous short stories and articles about writing and the teaching of writing. His story, Mother Love, recently won an Editor's Choice Award in the Raymond Carver Short Story Contest. In his story, my Father's Court, was published last winter in the anthology Confessions, Fact or Fiction, edited by Herta Feely, a writing program alumnus. His novel, Your Mother Should Know, is currently being circulated to publishers, and he hopes to finish his second novel, Mannion in Darkness, before the first of the year. He has taught in the Johns Hopkins MA in writing program since 1998, served as fiction advisor since 2002, and was named assistant director in 2010. Uh, we are all in for a real treat tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Farrington. I want to thank um, Christopher, who has probably had, what, about three hours sleep the last week? <laughs> He and his wife, like uh, like Kathy and her husband, um, Chris and his wife, just had their first baby uh, two weeks ago because I missed my class for it. <laughs> not, not that I'm holding it against them. <clears throat> um, for those of you who are wondering, how can there be a, a reading with several writers and not one of them is bleak? Um, you don't have to worry. <laughs> I, um, I almost want to borrow the opening line of Richard Ford's story, Great Falls, where he says, this is not a happy story, I warn you. Um, I'm going to be reading the second chapter of the novel that I've been working on for uh, two or three lifetimes, it seems, but hope do hope to finish in the next few months. It's also, um, after a few changes, became the short story that won the Editor's Choice Award in the Raymond Carver uh, contest. I'm going to read the story rather than the novel chapter because the story is a little more self-contained, although they're both very similar. Um, I knew that the chapter was bleak, but in looking over it and preparing it for uh, to read, um, I realized that, that the story is actually a little bleaker than the novel than the novel chapter because the uh, one of the things the novel is exploring is to what extent the past may determine the future in a person's life. Um, simply put, how much does what happened in your childhood contribute to who you are as an adult? The chapter I'm going to read is, um, will give you the rather bleak childhood of one Gerald Mannion. Um, in the novel, though, that chapter is juxtaposed against his adult life, which readers would be familiar with by now, but in the story they are not. So um, think about that as I go along, that he does, he does survive and grow up and at least struggled to have a reasonably productive life. The um, the story itself is called Mother Love, which is one word. Grown now and alone, 
Mannion remembers his past as severed bits of planets revolving around his mother, the sun. In one, he is 11 years old, trudging up a muddy mountain road on an afternoon of fall spring, his feet sucking and slapping through the caramel mess, his unbuttoned coat flung open like a gunfighter clearing sidearms. Ahead waits a big pink puffy ball on the grassy slope in front of their trailer. His mother's blonde hair is tied in pigtails, the way she wears it sometimes between men, when she doesn't care to look glamorous, just wants it out of her face. She wears pink rubber boots splattered with chocolate, it seems, pink tights that show the whiteness of her thighs through the stretched nylon and oversized pink-lensed sunglasses. She's been washing their blue chevette, sending soapy water bubbling down the gully edging their driveway, which held up this winter because she persuaded her last summer man to lay pebbles over the dirt before he left. The driveway is still uneven, but there are none of the chasms that forced her to park along the road in previous springs. Spotting him, she takes a rocky Balboa stance and pumps her fists. Woo-hoo, she cries, hopping lazy jumping jacks. Woo-hoo, she cries again, and he starts running, his flat-soled shoes slipping in the muck. At the edge of the lawn, he stomps both feet into a bank of snow and steps out, leaving mud-traced footprints behind. When his mother opens her arms, he rushes into them. She is so light and small, already he outweighs her. Yet he feels captured and safe with his face pushed into the puffy cloud of her coat, the powdery smell reminding him of dropping his head into the pillow at night. He can barely feel her inside all that jacket. Parting, she takes his hands and begins skipping to her left. He mirrors her, and soon they dance round and round, her face clean and full of joy. Gaunt as always, her cheeks red, her eyes big and bright for a change. She hasn't used anything for a while. She sings, her breath coming in spasms, and he catches only one gasp, phrase, repeated, mulberry bush. They are locked only by their fingertips, and when that grip begins to slip, her face flashes surprise as pure as a toddler's, as her feet go out from under her and she lands with a thud on her rump, and splashing the bottom of her pink coat, mud splashing the bottom of her pink coat, and laughing still, her eyes closed and her face gone blissfully blank, her whole pink back soaking into the dirty sponge of the lawn. He stands over her, giggly and afraid. Oh, lordy, 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 she says, her eyes open and pin him. I hope you know this is fucking cold. When she raises her arms, he steps forward to help her. He isn't expecting the sudden jerk, and he's helpless to do anything but drop, heading straight for the pink, big pink puffy mat below. At the last instant, she, he thrusts his palm against the open ground and flips clear of her. He settles on his back beside her. Now you know for sure how cold it is, she says. It's wet, he says. It's glorious, isn't it? A pleading in her voice, you must agree. Her gritty hand clasps, clasps his, and they lie like that on their backs as clouds dance around the sun. The cleanup is not so joyous, but they have no regrets. She showers and washes her hair and puts on jeans and a white T-shirt. All their dirty clothes she piles together in one basket for a late week trip to the laundromat but their scrubbed clean coats hang drying in the bathtub. They'll need those coats tomorrow when the temperature tumbles back into the teens. Hearing that forecast, she shouts Dairy Queen, and she and her son head for the soon-to-be-clean no-longer Chevette, the two of them bundled in sweaters and sweatshirts. Reaching the car, she flashes that same impish grin and raises the keys. Can I, he begs, please, just as far as the highway. His foot hitting the slick driveway almost causes another fall, but he clutches the door handle to keep upright. Check the mirror, fix the seats, she instructs. Wait, she says as he leans forward to insert the key. She grabs the pillow off the back seat and makes him take it, despite the tightness in his jaw, the shame in his cheeks. He hates having to sit on his pillow, craves the day he will no longer need it, but he will not sacrifice opportunity to avoid shame. He gets 2.7 miles of mud, downhill mostly, before he stops and slides into the opposite seat while she climbs over him to end up behind the wheel. She gets pavement for her 5.4 mile trip into Skowhegan, where they stop at the Dairy Queen and have hot dogs and fries for supper, hot fudge sundaes for dessert. Nothing special, this. No big event, no revelation. Just an explosion of joy at being alive on a spring day, false or not. 60 degrees with sunshine and the promise that sometime, maybe not tomorrow, but sometime soon, the real spring will come, and following that, the summer days of lying outside on lawn chairs, nights sleeping on a mat beneath stars. 
There may have been a whiff of love, too. She tended to have good luck with men in summer, but mostly it was his mother happy and he the beneficiary.